You're listening to Change Your POV Podcast, episode 36. He exploded. He mm. went off. He goes, I'm going to tell you, whoever the fuck you are. He goes, my friend Russ Waltman was killed in Vietnam 47 years ago. And you call my fucking house and pretend that you're somebody that you're not. And I said, Joe, hold up, buddy. Hold up. I said, I'm not dead. <laughs> Welcome to Change Your POV Podcast, helping you navigate transitions in your life, like entering and exiting college or the military, changing jobs or careers, and providing you with the coaching and mentorship needed to help you advance in your personal or professional life. Sometimes all you need is to change your point of view. Now, here's your host, Eddie Lazary. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to this conclusion episode with Sergeant Russ Waltman. If you missed the first part of this two-part series, I encourage you to go back and check out the first part at changeyourpov.com forward slash episode 34. This week's episode, we conclude our discussion about Russ and his time in Vietnam with specifically the 39th Cav ACV or air cushioned vehicle. Now, I found this just as intriguing as you probably are right now. I had no idea they had hovercrafts in Vietnam. But in fact, they did. Not many, but they did. And there was a few very brave individuals that decided to hop on and take these machines for a ride. And Russ was one of them. So I hope you enjoy the conclusion of this episode. But first, a word from our sponsor, Audible.com. Audible has over 180,000 titles to choose from. From fiction, nonfiction, thriller, romance, you pick the genre, they have it. Uh, I don't listen to many of those genres. I do listen to a lot of business books uh, as well as military books. So if you are like me and you like to listen to audiobooks because you're on the go a lot, I like to listen to them while I'm on a walk or at the gym or Uh, In my commute to and from work or wherever I'm going, I pop the earbuds in and I just uh, check out uh, a book. And uh, it's just a great way for me to consume my books because I don't have a whole lot of time to do it otherwise. Uh, So if you uh, would like your free book, your free download, head on over to changeyourpov.com forward slash free book for your free 30-day trial and a free audio download. So I want to talk, remember the story that you shared with me over the phone when we first talked um, about that uh, one of your teammates uh, was under the impression that you were killed, remember? Oh, Joe, yeah. Yeah, tell me that story. Uh, Joe, uh, uh, he he had a French last name. His name is Boudelet, and nobody in the outfit could pronounce it right, so they all called him Joe Boogaloo, (laughs) which was the song title back then. Uh, Okay. So... Anyway, we got separated right toward the end of our tour, and he went ahead and went home, and he heard that I was wounded. He went up to the hospital to check and see how I was, and uh, you know how paperwork is sometimes when you get a Mm -hmm. bunch of wounded in. The nurse on duty didn't, I'm sure, didn't do it intentionally, but she told him, she said, your friend was wounded, and he succumbed to his wounds on the chopper on the way in. He's gone. So Joe left, and for, what, 47 years, he thought I was dead. And we were close. I mean, we were closer than blood brothers. And through this Vietnam buddy finder, I gave him his, their, his name and his serial number, and they said, uh, will you stay close to the phone for the next half hour? And I said, yeah, but you've got to understand, I've been looking for him for 47 years, and I haven't found him. They said, well, we got different uh, search engines we can use. I said, okay. They they (laughs) called me back in 20 minutes and gave me his phone number. Wow. I couldn't believe it. It just completely blew me away. So he lives out in Oregon. I called out there, and his wife answered the phone, and this was in August. And I said, is this Joe Boudelais' residence? And she said, yeah. And I said, could I talk to him? She said, 
who should I say is calling? I said, just tell him an old friend from a long time ago. See, I was under the impression that he thought I was dead. Mm -hmm. So she went out. I could hear the screen door open, and she said, hey, Joe, there's some guy on the phone that says he's one of your friends from a long time ago. So Joe gets up, and he, I hear him walk up to the phone. He picks the phone up, and he goes, hello? I said, hey, Joe. I said, not knowing that he thought I was dead, you know, or else I wouldn't mm -hmm. try to break it to him easier. I was all, I was really happy because when he picked up the phone and said hello, his voice hadn't changed one bit. He was, I mean, I could close my eyes and see him standing right in front of me. I mm -hmm. said, hey, Joe, this is Russ Waltman. And instead of getting, you know, hey, how you doing? Uh, I missed you and all that and, and nothing but, you know, happiness. Uh, he's got PTSD as bad as I do. He exploded. He mm went off, he goes, I'm going to tell you whoever the fuck you are. He goes, my friend Russ Waltman was killed in Vietnam 47 years ago and you call my fucking house and pretend that you're somebody that you're not. I said, Joe, hold up, buddy. Hold up. I said, I'm not dead. I don't know where you come up with that. He said, I went to the hospital and the nurse told me. I said, Joe, I'm not dead. I'm not somebody trying to screw with you, buddy. I said, this is me, Russ. And he goes, how do I know? I said, ask me something that only you and I would know the answer to. So it was quiet for a minute. And when we were up in Aberdeen uh, training on these ACBs, they let us off on the weekends. And uh, the first weekend Joe and I met, we rented the car and we went into Baltimore. And so... Why he's thinking of a question, I said, uh, come on, ask me something. He goes, if you're Russ Waltman, he goes, where did we go the very first weekend pass we got? I said, we rented a blue Chevy Malibu, and we drove to Baltimore, Maryland. And all of a sudden, he just busted up and started crying. He hmm. goes, my God, you are alive. And I said, yeah. <laughs> hmm. And the funny part about it was is uh, – we went into Baltimore, hit a bar, got approached by a couple of prostitutes, and, and I don't know if this is allowed on your program or not. Sure, man. Go for it. <laughs> but mine was, like, uh, nice, and his was like Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he was taking one for the team, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> I went ahead and, and had my fun. I come back down, and he's still sitting on a concrete wall. And I'm going, you ain't going to go upstairs? And he gives me that look, you know? <laughs> like, okay, son of a bitch. I said, okay, ladies, we'll see you later. And for ever since that him and I got back together, he calls me, I call him, and he picks up the phone, and he goes, uh, who, who's speaking? And I go, the guy that introduced you to Chewbacca. <laughs> and he just started laughing. <laughs> For all these years, he thought I was dead, and for me to pop back up just out of nowhere, I can mm. imagine it pretty well blew his mind because it, it set me back, too. I told him, I said, man, if I'd, if I'd known that you thought I was dead, I wouldn't have come on with that big happy thing that I did in the beginning. And he goes, man, you just you just pissed me off so bad when, when I thought you was dead. And he said, and then I got some guy calling my house saying he's you. He said, I was just going by what the nurse said. Yeah, I mean, we, you lose you lose somebody in, in combat, you know, that you really care for, you've been with for a long time. Um, n no no number of years could pass to make that, that go away. You know what I mean? That was something that he probably struggled with for, you know, over 40 years. He told me, um, he told me after our, we had, we stayed on the phone for two hours. In fact, he caught hell from his wife when he hung up. She goes, we've been married 28 years, and you ain't never talked to me that long. <laughs> he told me, he said, that first night after we had that conversation talk for the first time in 48 years, he said, usually I go to bed and fall right to sleep. He said, I laid there all week, all night long. He said, cry. sometimes I'd cry. Sometimes I'd roll over and stare at the wall. He said, but I couldn't go to sleep because everything, it was like when we grew up, we had these little things called view masters. And you held them up to your eyes, and you put a disc in them, and you clicked it. And each time you clicked it, you got a different picture, mountains, horses, mm -hmm. a river, whatever. And uh, 
He goes, that night you and I got back in touch. He said, I couldn't even go to sleep. It was like I had a view master up in front of my face. And every time the picture would change, it would be me and you doing some of the crazy shit that we did when we were together. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I said, well, I said, I got a proposition for you. I said, I, I'm living here in Ohio now. I said, I got two brand new Harley Davidsons. I'm not married. And when I tell people I got two Harley Davidsons, they, they call it, they say bullshit. I said, well, I'm not married. And they go, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they go, oh, it makes sense now. Yeah. yeah. So I invited him from Oregon and he took a jet plane, flew in. And I picked him up in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, we took a nine-state uh, southern trip on uh, bikes. And just before we left the house, it was so ironic. Uh, Vietnam Buddy Finder called me, and they said, that guy you were looking for on your first tour? I said, yeah. They said, we found him. He lives right outside Gatlinburg, Tennessee. The guy that got wounded and you took his machine gun from your first tour? I said, John Latham? He goes, yeah. I said, give me his address. So Joe and I are getting ready to pull out of the driveway, and I come back in the house, and I called the phone number, and it was the same thing. Uh, he wasn't under the understanding that I had passed away like Joe. He knew I made it from my first tour. And mm -hmm. uh, when he got on the phone, I told him who I was, and he goes, uh, you was with me that day on the 31st of January? I said, yeah, I helped load you on the helicopter. And he said, what happened after that? I said, they made, they pushed me from ammo bear up to the machine gunner and I took over your gun and had it for the rest of the time. He goes, can you come down and see me? And I said, well, and then I told him the story about Joe. I said, we're just getting ready to pull out of the driveway and we're going, we got a nine state trip planned and it just so happens we're coming through Tennessee and he told me where he lived and it was 20 miles out of our way. Wow. So, uh, on our route down or coming back, we found his house and pulled over. And so I had dinner with a friend of mine from the second tour that thought I had died and a dinner with a friend of mine from the first tour. There was the three of us sitting there at the dinner table. And I thought, man, this don't happen very often. Yeah. And I no introduced kidding. the two of them and they got along great. And John was telling him stories about me and him and Kev and Joe was telling him stories. John stories about me and Joe in the ninth division mm -hmm. and it, it was great it was probably one of the re best nights of, since I come home really yeah because you see my family is all gone I'm the mm -hmm. only person left in my family and up until Vietnam buddy found finder found those guys for me I didn't have anybody I had acquaintances but you know how that goes acquaintances mm -hmm. but when you find one of your brothers from war mm -hmm. That's, that's better than finding a blood brother. So now, instead of being all by myself, I have managed to look up a total of six. So now uh, I've got six brothers, and we communicate on a regular basis. Before I forget, you told me you was from New Hampshire? Yeah. Joe's coming back this year. I traded one of my Harleys in on a brand-new 2016, and mm -hmm. we're going to ride from Ohio up to New Hampshire. And I was just wondering if there's any way that me and you could hook up once we got up there. Absolutely. Hell yeah, we can. All right. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You're going to come up and do the uh, Laconia no, they, Bike Week? or They said that's in June, and Joe can't come out until oh, okay. the last week of July and the first week of August, because that's when our reunion is. Uh, we're saving the second week for the reunion. The first week, we're going to ride up to New Hampshire. And that's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to meet you and... and Anyone else you bring up with you, for sure. Oh, I'll bring Joe with me, and, uh, he, you know, he can sit there and tell you some stories about them hovercraft, too. Hell, yeah. Definitely go out and grab some beers and listen to some of those stories. Now, which was one of those guys, remember the story you told me about the, uh, the, the rounds that were coming in? You were in that bunker or whatever? Yeah. Was one of those guys that guy? No. Uh-uh. Oh, that was a different yeah. guy. Okay. Okay. I couldn't remember who that was that you jumped on top of. Oh, that was uh, John Latham, the guy that lived in Tennessee. Yeah, we, that was the Battle of the Graveyard, January 31st, 66. And uh, that afternoon, uh, about four o'clock, them Arvins came up and handed me my dog tags at about 10 o'clock. But at four o'clock, John and I uh, ducked into the they had a little mud hut there where the 
the guy that tended the cemetery, it, that's where he lived. But when the firefights started, he took off for the jungle and disappeared. John and I seen a chance to duck into that hut and make us a cup of coffee. There was absolutely nothing in it, the hut. It was devoid of everything. It was just a mud hut with a thatched roof. So we mm -hmm. made a little fire on the floor and we were heating up two cans of water to make coffee. And uh, we heard the mortar go off on the hillside behind us and the round whistled over the top of the hut and landed about 35 yards behind us. And mm -hmm. John looked up at me and he just kind of grinned. And then we heard the mortar go off again. This time the round landed about 25 yards out in front of the hut. And John mm -hmm. looks at me and he says, you know, if we hear that son of a bitch off, go off again, you know where it's coming, don't you? And just mm -hmm. about that time, he no sooner got that out of his mouth, we heard that doop, that mortar round mm -hmm. coming. And he looked at me, I looked at him, he threw his coffee one way, I threw mine. And we, like I said, there was no furniture or nothing in this hut. It was just an empty hut with corners, you know, and... Mm -hmm. That was the only place I seen to take cover, so I dove for the corner, and it just so happened that John picked the same place to hide. <laughs> <laughs> I dove for the corner, slid up into the corner, and he landed on top of me. And right <laughs> after he landed and completely covered my body with him, and he later told me, I, I, I said, I think you saved my life that day. He goes, it wasn't intentional. It's just that <laughs> we both picked the same place to hide. <laughs> right, yeah. So as soon as he landed on top of me, the mortar round came in through the roof, and he got hit from his shirt line or his hairline all the way down to the top of his boots. Wow. And he rolled on his back. He rolled off of me and he looked over at me and he says, Brother, I'm hit. So I, I jumped up, and went and got the medic. And uh, mm. I was helping the medic as much as I could. We called the medevac in and uh, we loaded him on a helicopter. And I waved at him. And that was the last time I seen him until just this last summer. Wow. Wow. What a story, man. That's incredible. He lives on the lake down in um, Tennessee. Um, I can't think of the name, but it's a little small town outside of Gatlinburg. And mm -hmm. he's invited me to come down and go fishing with him uh, for a week down there on the lake he lives on. And, yeah. Uh, the ARs they got now are completely different than the M16s that we had in Vietnam. And, mm -hmm. and my hobby now is building ARs for people. Oh, cool. And That's awesome. I've built about seven of them so far. And uh, I know, John, we... M60 gunners had the sidearm of 1911s. Mm -hmm. So I know John was into ARs and 1911s big time. So uh, I went down to the gun store and I bought him a Ruger 1911. And then I built him an AR. And mm -hmm. April 15th, uh, about a month and a half from now, I'm going to go down there and present him with both of them. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. And stay there and fish and drink and tell stories. <laughs> that's right. That's the best, man. That's the best for sure. Well, that's cool, man. I definitely want to have you back on the show at some point and, and share with, uh, with me and, and the listeners more, more stories. And if you, can if you can convince any of your other buddies to, to hop on Skype and get a microphone or whatever, I'd love to talk with them as well. I'd really want to get more you know, Vietnam veterans on this show. I really think that you know, your guys' story is, is an important one to tell. For many reasons, right? I mean, uh, I remember when when I redeployed back from from Iraq, and just the, and, and to be honest with you, Russ, uh, when I when I came back, we got off the plane, we were coming through the the airport there. We had such a warm welcoming um, of people um, that were there to welcome us home, and the the majority of the people that were there welcoming us home were Vietnam veterans. Do you know what I mean? They they had their Vietnam vet hats on and. All of them you know, were saluting, they were extending their hands, and it was just overwhelming to see that. And, and I had a chance to kind of talk with one, and, and he says, you know, we, we are here doing this, um, welcoming you home, um, because this is the welcome that we never got. And it meant so much to me, just that connection. That was really my first um, connection with the Vietnam, other than being, you know, brothers in arms and being in the military, but... It really, really touched me, and, and you guys are have a special place in my heart and always will, and you guys are brothers to me. A little bit older than me, but um, you, you, you're still brothers nonetheless, and especially 
you know, calf brothers on top of that. So I know, um, I know you've heard the stories about how we got spit on and stuff when we came home and exited the airport. Yeah. Uh, I had a good friend with me and back then, I don't know if you guys still got them today, but back then we had a uniform. It was a summer uniform called khakis. Short sleeve. Oh, we, yeah, we don't have those, but yep. We had short sleeve khakis on, and my friend had all of his ribbons on, his CIB and everything. So did I. We were standing there on the curb waiting for a, a taxi, and a VW microbus pulled up, and door slid open, and they started throwing bags at us. And they missed me, but they hit my friend. And the bad thing about it was that the bag was full of feces, mm. and it hit right on his citations on his CIB oh, and, and busted open and just dripped down the front of his khakis. Mm. And he went so insane that I had to hold him. He wanted to go over there and just jump in the van and, you know, whip ass. And I mm -hmm. said, dude, there's six of them. There's two of us. Right. You know? Wow, man. So they laughed, closed the door and drove off. I took him back in the bathroom and helped him wash some of the shit off of his decorations and his uniform. But that was our first half hour back in the States. Wow, people are just so ignorant, you know. But you know what's so great now, Ed, is that uh, I'll be in a restaurant, a bank, a gas station, and I always wear my first calf hat. I got first mm -hmm. calf stickers on my truck in my house. I, I, I fly the first calf uh, flag. But to be out in public, and I've worn the first calf hat ever since I come home. And to have it had just started here in the last 10 years or so. But like being in a bank or somewhere, somebody will come up and recognize that hat and mm -hmm. they'll stick their hand out. And they said, we'd like to say two things. First of all, we'd like to apologize for the way you always treated when you come home. And second of all, we'd like to thank you for your duty. Mm -hmm. And it, it's pretty gut-wrenching to get it after all these years, but it's appreciated. Mm -hmm. at, Absolutely. You know? Just like the uh, just like the Silver Star, I guess better late than never, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, like I said, I'm not I'm not down in the the citation or the metal itself, but it's just a piece of metal with a ma piece of material attached. Yeah. What means right. most to me is that my brothers walked off of that hill that day. Yep, that's right. Absolutely right. I love you know, I love each and every one of them, and the ones that are gone, I mourn their loss. Uh, terrible i uh, i know where some of them are buried and i've driven to their states and uh, i cut the grass around their graves i uh polish their headstones and spend time with them sitting there talking to them and everything mm. uh it's just my way of, uh, of of dealing with my ptsd because they're the ones that helped me get back home absolutely right yeah they paid the ultimate sacrifice yeah, yeah. i remember my first my first sense of of the price that we paid in Vietnam was when I took a trip to Washington D.C. It was our I was in middle school, you know, middle schools always take the eighth graders or whatever. We take trips to Washington D.C. Well, well, that's what I did. I went to Washington D.C. and of course, you know, they've got all of the all of the monuments and all of the sites all picked out. You know, we we saw the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial and Jefferson Memorial and Went and visited the, you know, the Constitution and got to visit, the, you know, the Capitol Hill and all that. Um, and it was all great to see, don't get me wrong. But it was when we went to the Vietnam Wall when, and I started down the, the footpath there, you know, against the wall. And it starts out on one side, you know, narrow. Yes. And the wall gets bigger and taller and taller as you, as you continue to walk down and... And, you know, I was, uh, you know, the ripe old age of, I don't know, what are you in eighth grade, like 14 something, years old? Yeah, something like that. And, and I, just, I just couldn't help but stick my hand out and kind of caress the wall and feel the engraved names against my fingers as I walked along the wall and just was just completely taken back by the sheer numbers of names on the wall and, and every name you can possibly imagine first and last and I just it, I, I just couldn't fathom um, that sacrifice and what it meant and what this country you know sacrificed for that for that cause for that war dur during that time um, and to be 14 years old and to be that 
humbled by that, I think says a lot. Um, do, you, do you know how you were that day at the age of 14? Mm -hmm. Do you know that the youngest combat veteran in Vietnam was 14 years old when he was killed? No, I didn't know yeah, that. He, wow. he lied, his mom and dad threw him out of the house, abandoned him, and he went down and lied about his age and enlisted in the Marine Corps. And by the time he got to Vietnam, got assigned to his company, he had just turned 15 like a week and a half later, and they had made him an ammo bearer on an M60. The mm. Marine unit got ambushed, and uh, it, they sent him for more ammo. He exposed himself running across the LZ to get more ammo, and the sniper mm. took him out. So wow. he, he's on the, the wall as the youngest combat veteran to die in Vietnam. He was only 15. Wow. That's, that can't even imagine. That's just wow. Wow, man. You know, I hope thank I'm not you so rambling, Ed. No, 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 man. No, this is a good show. Um, uh, we're going to, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a question that I ask all my guests. Sure. As you know, this show is called change or POV, which stands for point of view. Um, and the question is this, can you give me a time when you thought of something one way and something happened, an event happened or, uh, some circumstance came about that caused you to, to think about that original thing in a different way or from a different perspective, what was it and what did you learn from that experience? I think uh, growing up in a military family, uh, I was born into the Army. My dad, 24 years, you know, I, I, and then when I got, I left his household, I went into the Army. So uh, it, it was like uh, patriotism back then. Your country was calling, you went just out of, of pure patriotism. You go out mm -hmm. over there, and you found out that, you know, they they send you into free fire zones. You'd get ambushed, and you'd call, and you'd have to ask for permission to fire back. And mm -hmm. they'd deny it, and they go, and we'd ask them if we're in a, a no-fire zone, how come we got KIAs and WIAs? And they said, no, mm -hmm. you have to pick them up and leave. You can't return fire. There's your dead friend laying next to you, and you can see the guy that shot him run from one tree to another to get a better shot on you. And there's some guy on the radio 25 miles in the rear telling you, you can't kill that guy that just killed your brother. Mm. And that hurt. And that started me to thinking about the whole Vietnam War. And I was in a real turmoil about it because I went over there thinking I was fighting communism and fighting for the United States. But what I found up, I wound up realizing I was fighting for my brothers, like you said mm -hmm. at the beginning of this, the brother on yep. your left and right, right? And then what sealed the cement coffin for me was, I don't know if you remember him, but he was one of the longest uh, held POWs. He actually ran for vice president with, for, with Ross Perot. His, his name was Stockdale. Mm -hmm. Do you remember him? I do, yeah. Okay. Well, he was a young lieutenant serving on an aircraft carrier. The whole thing, it was called the Gulf of Tonkin incident. That was the thing that was supposed to have started the Vietnam War. And uh, they said that one of their destroyers, I can't think of the name of it right now, but I, one of the destroyers had just received incoming fire from two PT boats. So they scrambled a couple of jets off the aircraft carrier. Stockdale being a young second lieutenant or first lieutenant, whatever you are in the Navy, he gets out to the coordinates they give him. There's no destroyer. There's no PT boats. So he radios back for confirmation. He says, are you sure you gave me the right coordinates? The call, and I heard these words come right out of the man's mouth because he was on TV. He said, when I was in the service, I had to sign papers uh, saying that I couldn't de divulge any classified information, but now I'm out of the service. He goes, I want people to know what happened. He said, that Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. He said, I was Johnny on the spot. I was the first one there. And they told me, they said, fire on the PT boats. He said, I called them and told them, there's no destroyer, there's no PT boats, and I'm at your location. He said, mm. and right on Nationwide TV, he said the next radio call he got, was go ahead and they have a master switch he was carrying uh, rocket pods on both wings they got a master switch that you throw up you can fire them individually or one at a time or two at a time 
but they got a master switch. You throw that up and hit a button, you'll fire all 24 rockets or ever how many there are. And he's seen his rockets just hit the water and explode into empty ocean. There was no boats hmm. or nothing. And he came hmm. back, and when he landed, as soon as he was climbing down out of his jet, there was an orderly there that said, you're, you're supposed to report to the admiral straight away without going to your quarters. So they usually go to a debrief, but he mm -hmm. was ordered to go to the admiral. So he went to the admiral, and the admiral said, you'll cease and desist, and you'll fill out the, the after-action report saying that you sunk two PT boats. And he said, sir, he said this, I seen this come right out of his mouth on TV. He said, there were nothing there. You ordered me to fire my rockets into empty water. And he said, well, this is the way the after action report is going to read. You hit two PT boats and struck, uh, sunk one and damaged the other. Fill that out and turn it in in the morning. And Stockdale said, I had no other, or, uh, other way out. Yeah, I was a lieutenant. He was an admiral. So he did. He turned that in. And the very next day, we uh, started hitting North Vietnam with airstrikes over a lie. The Gulf, mm. the Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. And they've actually come back. Turner Joy, the uh, destroyer's name was Turner Joy. The men mm. on the destroyer, they will also testify that they were not attacked that day. And they weren't even close to the coordinates that Stockdale was given. So... The United States government prefabricated this lie, backed it up with Stockdale's after-action report, and the next day they went into Vietnam and started bombing. And that's what started that whole shit house mess over there. It, we sent, I don't know how many millions of people over there, 58,000 plus came back in caskets, 350,000 came back with wounds. And I've read an article where the Vietnam vets now have uh, suicide up to, they're up to 119,000 suicides. Wow. Wow. Uh, so you had the combat deaths, you had 350,000 wounded, 117,000 commit suicide, and n untold numbers with PTSD. With all the mm -hmm. families wrecked back here in the States, and every, all the misery and, and downright bullshit that came with that war it all started over a lie and then mm -hmm. when you said it in you know like i live i live out in the country and i i i stay by myself a lot i like it better that way but i sit there in my chair with all the lights out staring out the window and i think you know i went into that war thinking that we were doing something really good but now i've just seen stockdale on tv tell me that it was all a lie and Mm -hmm. That changes your whole perspective of what you've done. I mean, I'm still proud that I stepped forward and answered the call. But now I've got questions in my mind. Why did our government lie to us and send us in to uh, action over an incident, incident that never happened? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and it, makes, and it makes you wonder, right, the, the, the totality uh, of the sacrifice that you just mentioned. Um, you know... Was it worth it, right? Right. Was whatever was whatever was supposed to have been accomplished, uh, was it accomplished? Was it worth? It? And I think, and I think they struggle with that today with Iraq and Afghanistan. They oftentimes I hear uh, our war in Iraq and Afghanistan being compared to that of Vietnam. Not saying that, not saying that we lost as many guys or um, that we fought in the same type of an environment or conditions, but the 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 comparison is exactly what you're describing that is you know what's what's the purpose what's the end goal what's the end state what's the objective right um and and how do you know how do you know when you're done if there's no objective how do you know when you've accomplished it, exactly right? i was talking to a, a air force major once and we were in a barn and, and i uh, was exchanging my views of the war with him and he said even though he flew above it all he said, we seen it from where we were at. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, we flew over Haipong Harbor when there was tankers unloading thousands of gallons of oil, you know, to further the war effort. And mm -hmm. our target for the day was some shack on the side of the hill with an observation plane seeing two 55-gallon drums sitting outside. Mm. So we fly over the tankers unloading the fuel 
and fly 100 miles inland and bomb a shack with two 55-gallon drums sitting outside. And then when we come back to go back to the carrier, them big ships were still sitting there pumping out oil. We weren't allowed to, to shoot at them or drop bombs on them or anything. Yeah, I, I, heard, I heard reports and some other guys that I was talked to that, uh, uh, what was that main, uh, that, that main trail that went from north uh, to Ho south? The Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, right. I mean, we knew that was a main avenue of, of uh, foot traffic for, for the enemy. And for the longest time, uh, we're never given authorization to even to bomb that or engage that in any way. Right. Uh, Crazy. I got a question for you. you uh, who was you with in the cab? I was with uh, 1st Battalion, 82nd Field Artillery. Uh, then can you tell me, somebody told me the cab is mechanized now. It is. Okay, yes. now I got a story for you. You know those M1A1 Abrams tanks? Yes. I came home and uh, with the MOS as an M60 gunner, you can imagine how hard it was for me to re-assimilate back in civilian life. Right. So a good friend of mine, uh, I was just landing nowhere jobs, you know. I didn't, I had nothing to put down on the application. So mm -hmm. a real good friend of mine told me, he said, you know where Troy, Ohio is? And I said, yeah. He said, they got a welding school there. He said, you go there and get uh, as many certifications and as many different kinds of welding techniques as you can. He said, because any city you go into the United States, you look into one ads, it's nurses, truck drivers, and welders. And so mm. I took him up on his uh, advice because of the fact that uh, I was that currently living about 45 miles from that town, Troy. Yeah. Um, I was working as a bouncer in a bar. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I went up to the, the school, and they said, yeah, you know, we'll accept your GI Bill. So I went to night school for six months and learned several different types of welding techniques and procedures. And I graduated on a Friday, and Monday I got a telephone call from a Lima Army Tank Plant. And they asked me if I'd like to build uh, M1A1 Abrams tanks. And I said, yeah. So they told me where to go, and I went there, and they gave me a welding test. And... Uh, I said, man, this is great. I mean, two years in Vietnam, I come home, I land a $19 an hour job welding and on Army equipment, too. Uh, this is just great. So I worked there until my disability came through, and uh, I retired on disability. But we built 10,000 of those M1A1 Abrams tanks. Wow. So you know who they were named after, right, those Abrams uh, yeah, tanks? Yeah, General Abrams, uh, Creighton, Creighton Abrams, I think his name was. Cre Creighton, yeah. Do you know his son? No. Abe. Abe? Abe Abrams. Nah. He's now a four-star general, General Robert Abrams. Um, he is the commanding general of U.S. Army Forces Command, and uh, but he goes by Abe. Anyway, he was my brigade commander when I was in Iraq. Wow. Really? Yep. Yep. Served him. He was a, a full bird colonel at the time, and he was the brigade commander. And uh, I think it was all of our first combat deployment. So it was our first combat experience. And I served under him. And uh, I was, uh, my unit was 1st Battalion, 82nd Field Artillery. But we were attached to the Brigade Reconnaissance Troops. So we actually worked as, a, as an attachment working directly for him uh -huh. um, as the Brigade QRF, or Quick Reactionary Force. So I uh, worked a lot with him, hand-in-hand -hand with him. R great guy. And now, yeah, he's, uh, I got out, of course, he stayed in and worked his way up. But, yeah, so yeah, he is the um, now currently uh, four-star general. Wow. Um, and the United States Army Forces Command. So, well, that's where he works for, but he is the commanding general of U.S. Armed Forces Command. That's his, that's his uh, position now. So, small world, man. And so there you are building those bad boys back then. Yeah, huh? and... It was broken up into departments, you know, one line made the haul, the other line made the turn. And after working there about a month, I let the guys know that I said, uh, I'm not trying to be a prick or anything. I said, but I'm going to hold you guys to tight standards because, see, we got sent into battle with a piece of shit rifle. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't want the same thing happen to the guys that are going to be riding inside of these things. Right. So, yeah. I'm going to put it to you bluntly. Either do your job right. And I, I had no position. I wasn't a foreman or anything. I was just a welder. I said, I'm just asking you to do your job right and consider 
while you're welding, the men that's going to have to be inside this tank when you go when they go into combat. So mm -hmm. do what do your best on this job. And I I was yeah. appreciated for that. People came by and said, you know, uh, I seen so and so make a bad weld. I said something to him, you know. He picked up a grinder and ground it out. So that made me feel good that they, they, even the civilians that worked in there, there was some vets worked in there, but mostly civilians. But uh, they changed their mind over the course of time, you know? Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I had the proud distinction of uh, building out 10,000 of those things. Holy cow. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of welding, man. Yeah. <laughs> tell you, too, uh, the job I held for nine years was putting, uh, there were, they hadn't come up with a process to put the rear doors on those two big rear doors that cover the engine compartment. Uh -huh. One door weighed 1700 pounds. The other door weighed 900 pounds. And when they, oh, yeah. when they put them on, they sagged because the guy that put them on didn't know how to, and you could only close them up to about four inches. And then you had to, <laughs> it was funny. I seen a, a foreman have a, a forklift driver, turn the forklift around and back it up and push the doors closed. I walked oh, over wow. there and I told him, I said, you do know them doors got to be cut off and re repositioned. He goes, no, we're going to load it on the train. I said, no, you ain't either. I said, those <laughs> men out in the field, they're not going to have a forklift to shove them doors closed. And he says, right. what, you think you can do a better job? I said, if you give me about a week to figure out something, a new way to do this, so they won't sag when they put the, when they go to close the doors. I said, I, I think I can come up with something. So he, he said, you got one week. And in one week, I came up with a new process. And uh, it was kind of funny. After I'd been on the job for about six months, everything we welded was x-rayed and, and mm -hmm. checked out by inspectors. And the people that came around, uh, they, were, they were aware of the problem of the doors that people couldn't get them on there right. So when they come around, one of the, the inspectors, his name was Charlie, and uh, there was three foremen and the two supervisors standing there one night, and they said uh, they had three hall, four halls sitting butt to butt, and uh, they said, who put the doors on these? These guys are supposed to take soapstone and sign their name. Charlie uh -huh. and the rear doors got louvers on them. Charlie walked over, and he stuck three fingers in the louver, and he pulled, and the doors come open. He said, Russ Waltman welded this one. And the inspector mm. said, how can you tell? He said, he's the only one that can put these doors on without them sagging. And mm. the tank they moved to next was the doors were put on by the guy on day shift. And it was one of the tanks that they had to back a forklift up to shut the doors. So mm -hmm. uh, they made me the doorman. And that's what I'd done. I said, you, you let me uh, do this job like I'll do it. And I guarantee you'll never cut off another set of doors. And since then, I've run into guys that, you know, were with the cab. And, uh, I, when I tell them that I helped build that M1, A1, they, mm -hmm. they start coming out with pros and cons and everything. And they said, and we, on each one, we took a welding rod and we welded like the first one was zero, 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 one mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And I told them, I said, I think I welded on them up till. The we were in the seven thousands, seven thousand mm -hmm. plus, and uh, the guy I, I met a bunch of vets in a bar one night, and I went over and sat down and started talking to him, and this one guy said, "Yeah, he said one of the pro, pro, uh, one of the cons we had is the fucking rear doors on some of them were bits to shut." <laughs> <laughs> You're like I I know why. <laughs> Man, that made me feel so proud. And then I related the same story to them that I just told you. And they said, yeah. wow, man. Because there was some that we could open and close with just pulling on with our fingers. But there was other ones we had to actually back a vehicle up to, to shut, you know, get them to shut. I'm pretty proud of that. Hell, yeah, man. Nothing like uh, nothing like hearing that forward, man. I mean, you 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 know, you, you just got a whole life of service. I mean, your your father served, carried it on to you. You served. Uh, and then when you got out, you continued to serve, you know what I mean? And, and that's just, that's awesome, man, because not, and not everybody can say, uh, that they've had a life of service, but you can, and you should be very proud of that. And I'm, I am. I'm very, I'm very proud to, have, uh, run into you on Facebook and I'm proud to, to meet you and talk with you and, and call you my friend, even though we've, we've never met in person, but you know, as well as I do, um, 
that's not that's not a requirement to be to be connected like brothers, right? It's about the service and it's about understanding, you know, hardship and 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 where we've been and and what it means to us and understanding the sacrifices that other people have made and and not just those that have served, but those like you said, the family members back home that you know their lives will be, never be the same again. You know, right. I tell you what, it's a it's a real pleasure talking to you, and I hope I didn't ramble and, and go on too too long. No, but no, not at all. But your we're gonna your title. Oh, go ahead. Your title here is change your point of view. And that last question you asked me, I was yeah. I was patriotic when I went to the first tour and fought, even when I went to the second tour. But when I came home and seen Stockdale say that the war was all fought over a, a non-existent uh, incident, it never happened. That's when I changed my point of view. Yep, absolutely. But I'm still yeah. proud of my service, so. Absolutely, never give that, never give that up, man. Regardless of why we were there, uh, regardless of whether we agree with uh, the decisions that government makes, um, you know, the service is the ser- our service is our service, and nobody could take that away. You know what I mean? And, exactly. And 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 the wonderful thing about it is, is you and I have the freedom. Uh, to sit here on a podcast and voice our opinions and speak freely about it. Why? Because we fought for those freedoms. Exactly. And and you know and even when people, you know, have the audacity to to burn the American flag and stomp on it, a lot of these young college kids that are just uneducated don't understand what what they're doing or, or you know what they're you know what that really means. You know, people ask me about that, know that I've served, and they're like, you know, doesn't that get you fired up? Doesn't that make you angry? And I say, you know what? Yeah, it does because they don't they don't really understand what that what that represents, what that uh, what that symbolizes. I said, but at the same time, you know, I was the one that fought for their freedoms and ability to do that, and. It is, it's a conflicting feeling. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if uh, uh, you've seen the post, but uh, they, they had it on Facebook the other day where an uh, active uh, duty member, he's off duty and he walks into a, a fast food restaurant, uh, McDonald's or whatever, and mm-hmm. uh, there's a woman standing next to him in line, and evidently it's pretty close to a military post. And it, this was a big thing on Facebook, and the guy goes, uh, excuse me, but do you give military discounts here? And the lady standing next to him in line just went off. I mean, just went off on him. She goes, people like you really piss me off. And he goes, what do you mean, people like me? He goes, she said, you veterans, you act like you're entitled to something. He goes, ma'am, we gave up our privileges so you could have yours. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, if I could just take her by the hand, turn back the clock, and just say I could take her through that 12-hour battle in the graveyard mm-hmm. and have her right by my side. I'd handcuff her to me and let her see how people died, got disemboweled, decapitated, uh, dismembered. And the ones that got caught, got castrated. And they, and the Viet Cong had a nasty, uh, habit. If you lost a guy, you know, we never left anybody behind, but in the jungle, uh, sometimes your front line pulls forward and backs up and you, Sometimes you just leave, have to leave guys laying there because it'll cost you more guys to go in and get the dead bodies. But mm-hmm. we always go back in the day, the next day or the day after. And they had left the area and took all the uh, equipment off of our soldiers. But the things that really bothered us the most is that they select two or three of them, maybe the ones that were giving them a hard time or something, and they tie them to a tree and they castrate them and cut their penis off at the same time and then when we moved back into the area we'd find their bodies tied to a tree and their testicles would be one in each cheek and then they'd turn the penis around and stick it in the mouth so that the head was sticking out Mm. and that's the way we would find our brothers when we moved back into an area after a firefight like they might have us pulled back because they're bringing in airstrikes and then they Mm -hmm. say go back in well when you go back in that's where you find your brother and you, wow. you stand there looking at him, and a medic comes up and they hands you a plastic bag like a sandwich baggie, mm-hmm. and he says SOP is, you know, standard operating procedures. All body parts must accompany the body home. So somebody, mm-hmm. somebody, we always try to pick somebody that wasn't that guy's friend. I actually mm-hmm. had to go up there and pry his mouth open, dig his two testicles out of his mouth and the penis 
put him in a plastic bag and then put a shirt on him and put private parts in that bag and put him in his shirt pocket and then tag him and bag him. Mm. Wow. Yeah, man. Yeah. And it's tough when you're fighting an enemy that doesn't follow the same rules or don't have the same rules that you have, right? Yeah, we had a very frustrating. We had a battalion of Korean soldiers over there. They called the White Horse Division, and they were some bad mo getters, man. Mm. And they said the reason you guys are getting your ass kicked, he said you fight war like you. I told him about the no fire zone, and he says mm -hmm. uh, we don't do that shit. He said we don't have no war. We go into the jungle if somebody's trying to kill us, we kill them, mm -hmm. and it's just that simple. When they gave us a, an advisor. He stayed with us for a couple of days, and uh, he could speak Korean, English, and Vietnamese. And when we go through a village, he would uh, uh, con conduct uh, interrogations of these people. And I actually, and I, I hope you don't think this is a bullshit story, but he was questioning this pregnant Vietnamese lady. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, there hasn't been any Viet Cong in this village in a long time. And one of my friends, friends his name was Joe Payne. He was walking across the front of this lawn that was in front of this little mud hut. And mm -hmm. we heard him scream. And when I turned around and looked, I seen a big hole in the ground. And I thought, fuck, he fell into one of those punji pits. So oh, yeah. I ran over there thinking I'm going to see him with all these bamboo shoots sticking out of him and everything. Yeah. I run over and I look down in the fucking hole. He's laying there on his back laughing like a fucking maniac. And, I, and he's laying on packs canteens, rifle stocks, uh, helmets, and they were from different origin. I, th I think there was even some French equipment in that hole. Wow. The Korean comes over, and he looks down in the hole, and he turns around, and he walks back over to the lady, and she's about six months pregnant. And he says, in Vietnamese, he says, I thought you said there was no Viet Cong to here in the last six months. And she's scared shitless because now she knows she got caught in a lie. Yeah. She just stands there, and without a blink of an eye, I was standing three feet from him. He pulled his knife out and stuck her right in the belly. Wow. And killed her. And he turned Jeez. around, and he looked at me, and he says, you got any problems with that? And I said, no. You, you yeah. do what you got to do. But nobody ever screwed with them. See, when, when uh, he, uh, we went by our base camp, the first Cav base camp, we had mm -hmm. six rows 10 foot high double road Constantina with barrels of 55 gallon napalm buried in between the rows, 50 calibers, 106s. We had all that shit. And uh, he said, In a couple of days, my week with you is going to be up and you're going to drop me off at my camp. He said, I'm going to show you the difference between our perimeters. And that's mm -hmm. as far as he went with the subject. A week later, we patrolled through the jungle. We come to their base camp, and God's honest truth, Ed. I'm standing there, and we broke out of the clearing, and he starts showing us things. And I look down, and there's one strand of bob wire about 14 inches off the ground. One single strand, not six rows, 10 feet high, double row. Right. I said, I said, well, with only one strand of bob wire, don't Charlie come in here and fuck with you at nighttime? He said, they used to when we first got here. We strung that one strand of bob wire up, actually, to keep the cows out. No I shit. I said, so explain to me how these guys don't come in and screw with you at night like they do us. He said, we, when it first started happening, we caught one of them alive. We tied his hands behind his back, and then we took a cling rod from a 50 caliber, and we drove it through one ear and out the other and tied ropes on him, and their camp was right on a road that led into a town. And he said, we hung him up on that front uh post right there by the road which was traveled by hundreds of people every day and they put a sign around his neck in Vietnamese they said you come to us when we're sleeping this is where you'll be hanging tomorrow morning right alongside this guy wow and he said we never had no problems the the Viet Cong were scared shitless of those Korean guys mm -hmm. man because they knew they fought with no rules so if they had their druthers, if they seen a platoon of Koreans coming and a platoon of Americans, they jumped the Americans because they knew that we had, you know, rules of engagement. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I don't want to keep on going on because uh, I'd really no, like to still... hook up with you when we come up there. Yeah, yeah I'm going to get you back on here, man, and, and talk some more so we can have some more stories. But, yeah, we'll wrap it up here. 
Um, I'll do the close out here real quick. Um, thanks everyone for listening to Change Your POV podcast. It was a bl- it was an absolute pleasure having Russ Waltman on the show with us today, telling us his his uh, stories of combat um, and everything that he and his buddies uh, did for this great country. And I'm very very proud to have served um, after him in his shadow with the First Cav Division uh, during my time uh, in in uh, uh, in the Army and First Cav and, and over in Iraq. Uh, you can find all the show notes for this episode over at changerpov.com. Never miss an episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We have a lot more great content headed your way. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can email me at eddie at changerpov.com. I would love to hear from you. Until next time. To my cavalry brothers that have paved the path before me, to those who I proudly serve with, and to those who have and who will come after me, I dedicate this poem, Fiddler's Green. Halfway down the trail to hell in a shady meadow green are the souls of all dead troopers camped near a good old time canteen. And this eternal resting place is known as Fiddler's Green. Marching past straight through to hell, the infantry are seen, accompanied by the engineers, artillery, and marines. For none but the shades of cavalrymen dismount at Fiddler's Green. Though some go carving down the trail to seek a warmer scene, no trooper ever gets to hell ere he's emptied his canteen. And so rides back to drink again with friends at Fiddler's Green. And so when men and horse go down beneath a saber keen, or on roaring charge of fierce melee, you stop a bullet clean, and the hostiles come to get your scalp, just empty your canteen, and put your pistol to your head, and go to Fiddler's Green.